Andrea Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you'd give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java Junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T4C. If you're interested in learning more about what it's like to work in animation, developing and producing new animated features, as well as what it's like to create Broadway musicals, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest has spent the last six plus years doing just that. But before I introduce you to Johnny Pearl, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's newsletter that has career advice, insights, and inspiration for college students and young professionals. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign up box is right there. Now, my poor over loving aspiring producers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated beverage because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Johnny Pearl, a production supervisor at Cinemation, where he's responsible for supporting producers and artists to ensure consistency in story and quality all across stages of production. Johnny has been working at Cinemation since June 2016, shortly after graduation, where he began in creative development, which involved managing the creative strategy for a variety of animated projects, at least one of which we'll be digging into in just a few minutes. A year after Johnny joined Cinemation, and it was June 2017, A year after Johnny joined Cinemation in June 2017, he took on additional roles as a freelance development coordinator at Warner Animation Group and as a freelance screenwriting consultant and educator at Roadmap Writers and Stage 32. I think that's the same organization. Johnny has also worked as the artistic managing director and co-founder of Shinbone Theater, where he's created immersive theatrical events and new musicals in Los Angeles. Among his productions, there was an opening night party for Warrior, which is an HBO Cinemax crime drama, as well as the 2019 immersive production of Rock of Ages. Johnny, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I am. I'm ready to go. Thank you for that introduction. Your voice is amazing. Oh, my gosh. Well, I take that as a huge compliment. You haven't heard me sing, however. I don't think it translates into that area. We're still early. Maybe we'll sing later. All right. Well, certainly I know you can sing, but I actually have to go back to the caffeinated question, Johnny. I know you're drinking water because I can see you. Are you a caffeine drinker? Not frequently. However, this weekend was a long weekend of events, and I found myself having a morning Celsius energy drink. I don't know if you've had those. Never Uh, heard of it. I don't drink energy drinks with any regularity, but that one got me through. So good review on a Celsius energy drink. Okay, cool. Another one to add to the list. So why don't we kick things off, Johnny, with where you are working right now. The company is called Cinemation, and I'm guessing it's an independent studio? And if so, how did you discover it? Cinemation is headed by this man, Rob Minkoff. Rob Minkoff is most famously known for directing movies like The Lion King and Stuart Little, One and Two, and Mr. Peabody and Sherman. And now most recently, Pause of Fury, The Legend of Hank, which comes out in theaters this Friday. Woohoo! Second part of that question was, how did I become part of Cinemation. 
right? Yes. It's a story. So bunker down. Here we go. My school, UCLA, had a program called Dinner for 12 Strangers, which was what it sounds like. You get 12 strangers associated with the school to have a meal together. So that's students, alumni, faculty of the school. We all get together and have dinner. At this dinner, I met a man. His name is Steve Fickinger. Steve had been the vice president of creative development at Disney Theatrical. So he was a Broadway producer who had also worked in the animated space at Disney on movies like Lilo and Stitch and Tarzan, Mulan. Then he transitioned into the Broadway producing side for Disney and brought their musicals to stage like Lion King and Aladdin and Newsies and Little Mermaid, high school musical, mega Disney Broadway hits. So if you had asked me in high school or middle school what kind of career I would have wanted, I would have said, I want to do that guy's career to take these animated movies and bring them to stage. And he had basically already done all the things that I wanted to do as a kid. So it was very serendipitous to meet him perchance at this dinner for strangers. We connected over our shared love of musical theater. At the time, he was producing a show called Dear Evan Hansen, which had not yet gone to Broadway, but I had been fortunate enough to see it in Washington, D.C., which is where it had premiered. And that's where I'm from. I was able to talk with him about his show. We bonded there. Then I was dumb. I was a dumb college student. I did not exchange contact information with Steve. I was close to graduating, but I was shy and I, I didn't know like how to manage that conversation of, hey, let's talk later. But I got lucky again. And that summer, right after graduating college at the Hollywood Bowl's production of A Chorus Line, I ran into Steve again. And I mean, what are the chances? Right. The Hollywood Bowl, for anybody who knows it, is a ginormous place where you see usually some kind of concert. Yeah, exactly. It's huge. I'm Googling right now. Hollywood Bowl. (laughs) The Hollywood Bowl has a capacity of 17,500 people. Yeah. There you are later in the summer at the Hollywood Bowl and... Mm -hmm serendipitously, I would call it magically, you see Steve again. Yeah. And seeing him there, I gathered up my courage (laughs) to say hello, because I was still shy for whatever reason. And that conversation turned into, oh, what are you doing? Oh, I just graduated. Oh, email me. Let's talk. Getting further, I'll just tell you the whole story. After that conversation and a few emails with him, He sends the email that says, I have some work you could do for me. Are you interested? Of course, I'm interested. Then I don't hear from him for a couple of weeks. And I'm like, oh man, he must have forgot. So being a savvy millennial, I check his Facebook and it's public. And I see two things on his Facebook. The first is, there's a recent college grad I'm thinking of hiring. How much should I pay him? (laughs) Like, oh, this is good. And I can see what people are recommending to pay me. And the second thing was that his mom had just died. So understandably, not as focused on whatever work he needed to get done. Then, unexpectedly, I get a call from him. He says, hi, Johnny. Sorry, I haven't gotten back to you. My mom just died. Oh, Steve, so sorry to hear that. Me and my producing partner, Rob Minkoff, are trying to put together a musical. It is an adaptation of the Chinese movie, Farewell, My Concubine. And we are trying to turn it into a Broadway musical. And we need, we're planning this trip to New York and we need someone to help us manage this trip to New York to meet with potential composers, book writers, directors. Can you help us? Yes. Great. I'm going to put you on a call with Rob. And that's the beginning. That's the short story of my entrance into working with Cinemation. Incredible. Oh my gosh. I love so much about that story, Johnny. And just for our listeners, I think it is supernatural to be shy about approaching somebody who's like a mega star, successful person in any industry. And gosh, I think you are to be commended for having summoned up the courage to go up to him and look at the doors that it has opened. How big is Cinemation? Very small. It's basically 
Rob. <laughs> I work with Rob and then Rob brings in different people for different projects. And some of those projects are smaller. His projects start usually with a writer, a director. Then you can bring in different artists to design characters, design settings, the visual development of that world. And then as projects pick up steam, they can grow into huge productions and that ends up taking up more time than the smaller. Absolutely. And one of those big productions, of course, you mentioned just a moment ago is Paws of Fury, the legend of Hank. We are doing this interview on July 12th, which is a Tuesday. And you said it's coming out on Friday. Is that right? Friday, July 15th. So exciting. And it has an all-star cast, including Samuel L. Jackson, Michael Cera, Mel Brooks, Michelle Yeoh. Can you take us behind the scenes, Johnny, and explain how you helped move this project forward and how long it took to get from the printed page into production into theaters? A long time. (laughs) So this production has a, a long history. The first draft of the script was written by Ed Stone, the screenwriter. His most successful like solo screenwriter movie is a movie called Happy Texas, which was popular at, I think, Sundance Film Festival. He's also a punch-up comedy writer. So he's a kind of guy that studios will come in, look at any movie they're working on, and then say, hey, Ed, you're funny. You can make this funnier. And he is. He's just one of the funniest people I know, for sure. Probably one of the funniest people in the world. He had a first draft of this movie called Blazing Samurai in 2012. And the idea was, what if you could take Blazing Saddles, which is an older movie from 1974 by Mel Brooks, about a town of white people that gets a black sheriff, and it deals with themes of racism, and overcoming racism, and satirizing racism. Ed said, what if we could take that structure and do a mashup of Eastern samurai cinema with this Western cowboy cinema. So that was 2012, where the first draft started. And Ed brought the script to Rob. Rob was looking at it and he said, well, what if we made this more of a fable that was accessible to families and children? That started the journey of turning it into a story about dogs and cats. And this movie is now about a town of cats that gets a dog samurai and the dog has to overcome the cat's hatred of dogs. The first company that was producing this movie went bankrupt, not necessarily because of this production, but for their own problems. And so I came in seven years later in 2019. <laughs> When Rob had come in and he was trying to salvage the wreckage from the bankrupt company, right? So they had character designs. They had a lot of recordings of the actors already. They had a version of the script and they had a lot of storyboards. Using those materials and working with a small team of creatives, Rob, Mark Kutzier, who is now the co-director on the movie, Mike Andrews, who is the editor, and Alex Schwartz, who is our producer, and then a couple other Rob's creative consultant friends. He would bring in friends of his from previous productions just to get their creative opinions, which he has an impressive roster. It was cool when Kirk Wise comes in, who directed Beauty and the Beast and Hunchback, and Jonathan Roberts, who wrote The Lion King. He brings in cool people to get their opinions on these movies. With all those people, We salvaged the wreckage from the bankrupt company, reworked the story into something that was tighter, hopefully funnier, and just all around a better version of the movie. We we tried to improve it, make it better. We then used that new version of the movie that we created just with sketches and a lot of scratch voiceovers. A lot of it was Rob's voice and other people's voices. I did some voices. We used that version of the movie to then go to new producing studios and say, hey, we have this package. We need someone to complete the animation and to really put it all together, which brought us eventually to this company, Anaventure and Cinesite, which are in Montreal. 
and most of our animation production was then done in Montreal while we were in LA, even though there was the possibility of us going to Montreal at the beginning. COVID happened, right? March, 2020. And everyone in Montreal was at home and everyone in LA was at home. The whole world, we were all at home. Most of the animation production, including the final voiceover recordings for all of the cast were done from home. My role in that was managing all the pieces coming from all over the world as they came in and making sure that each scene had all the requirements that it needed, all the lines recorded, each step of the animation production process and keeping us on schedule and within budget to finish the movie. Then when we finished the movie, it was time for the marketing of the movie. That was another six to eight months of that. And now finally we are here at premiere was for me. I went this weekend to the premiere and the wide release is this weekend. Oh my gosh. How did you learn how to do this? Good question. Thank you. On the go. Like as it happened, really. But rewinding, my earliest creative background is in musical theater. I started singing and dancing when I was a kid, when I was five. And in musical theater, you learn the collaborative work style that is needed for these big creative productions. So there's a lot of crossover skill between putting on a stage show and then making an animated movie. I started producing in high school because I wanted to, to be in Rent, right? Rent is one of my favorite musicals. I had a group of friends that were into it as well. And I said, let's just put on Rent, right? So I didn't think of it as producing. I was just like, oh, it's my friends. We're hanging out. We're putting on a show. But that was the earliest stages of, okay, well, to put on a show, what are the things we're going to need? We're going to have to need our cast. We're going to need a director. We're going to need a creative team. We're going to need our tech. We're going to need our costumes. We're going to need the music. We're going to... And it was that checklist that was almost already just intuitive to me because I had been doing musicals since I was eight that I wasn't thinking of it as producing, but it was when I was in high school. And those same styles of conversations are the same kind of conversations we have now on big animated movies. I think that's such a great example of the power of transferable skills. So you took what you had done just kind of for fun with your friends and I'm guessing continued while you were in college to a certain extent and then just applied it to a new venue, animated Mm -hmm. films. I would imagine, Johnny, that someone who was responsible for another way of putting it is workflow, Mm -hmm. (laughs) deadlines, assignments, production reports, tracking documents, all the things that you've detailed in your resume, which I have right here. Sure. You would need to be highly organized. How did you hone that skill? How did I hone the skill of organization? Google Calendar helped a lot. (laughs) I didn't discover that until after college. I used to write everything down in a regular calendar. I think for me, and this is not just production and work style organization, but maybe lifestyle organization, is to break things down into smaller bits, right? So, I mean, look at a lot of people's email addresses, right? You look at their inbox and there's like 12,000 emails, right? I'm very organized. (laughs) There we we go. I'm raising my hand. That's me. (laughs) With my email, because there are so many different projects and so many different jobs I work on, I'm super organized. Every email that comes in gets put in a different folder for that project, right? This idea of... A big project or big anything can be overwhelming. But when you break it down into smaller chunks, everything is more manageable. And if I can use a metaphor, this is something I use in piano as well, right? I I play piano. My piano teachers would, would teach me the same thing, right? If you look at a full page of music, it can be very overwhelming to try to play everything. 
but you can almost always play two notes and then you can add on the third note or the fourth note. But breaking anything down into smaller bits makes everything more manageable. And that's how I stay organized. Fantastic. So take us into a typical day for you, Johnny, as a production supervisor. And I recognize you've had different stages of this particular film's production life cycle. So just pick a day during that period of time. Yeah. So I'll pick a day when we were in middle of production on Pause of Fury, but we were developing other scripts. One script that's in development right now is a new movie called How Winston Delivered Christmas. And it's an adorable story about a mouse who delivers a letter for a little boy to Santa on Christmas. On a normal day during production of Pause of Fury, our team is based in Montreal. To deal with the time difference while I'm in LA, of the directors, editors were in LA. We would usually start at about 8 a.m. our time with a Zoom meeting where we would use a program called Sync Sketch. The animators could show a shot that was in progress, right? And sometimes these shots are three seconds, sometimes they're 10 seconds, sometimes they're 15. Small bits. It takes a lot of time to complete an animated shot, right? So let's say we're already in animation and the animators would show us their pass. What if Jimbo, the mentor samurai cat, what if he goes like this? And it's just him lifting his arm to his shoulder with his sword. And then the directors would give their notes, right? They had these pads at their houses where they could draw on top of the drawings that were on screen. So their drawings were immediately in real time being shown to all of us in Montreal and here, some of the team in London some of the team in Vancouver. We would have these meetings, different shots, right, in the movie would be in different stages. So one might be, how's this motion? Great. Another meeting later might be, how is this camera move? Great. And keeping track of the notes and the status of each shot to make sure that it had everything that it needed. You go from the storyboards, which is just 2D drawings, into layout, which is the 3D creation of the world and the the camera angles that will be in that shot. Then, only then do the characters start to move with animation. And that doesn't look finished until you add lighting, which makes the the final finished look, and effects. Lighting was something I never thought about as a thing for animation until getting there on this step in Pause of Fury. I didn't realize how important that was. Meetings like that throughout the day. And then... And I'm Um, sorry to interrupt, but are you taking notes during this time? Are you having to keep track of what decisions were made? Or is that just incorporated by the people who are, let's say, the animators in Montreal? I had other production management staff with me to keep track really on both ends. We shared tracking documents to make sure all these notes were taken care of. And really to make sure that every scene had every element that it needed. Oh my goodness. A lot in the weeds. And you could spend a lot of hours on something that feels very small. When you think of it, this is hopefully something that's going to be seen millions of times. So it's worth it to get those details exactly right. All right. You might start off with a meeting like that. And then what? Yeah. So those are production meetings. Story meetings are some of the most exciting for me because it's figuring out the bigger creative. If those production meetings are more like details, how are we going to make this happen? Development is, well, what do we want to make happen? First is, what what do we want it to be? And then production is, okay, but how do we actually do it? Development is blue sky, is how do we, what is the dream for this project? So those are meetings with writers, producers. For an example, on on How Winston Delivered Christmas, we would meet with Alex T. Smith, who is the writer of the original book, writer and illustrator. He makes these wonderful drawings. And he's a very clever 
writer and he's British, so it's fun to talk to him. <laughs> and we were figuring out how to turn this book, which is an advent calendar style book. The kids are supposed to read it with their families and read a chapter every day of December leading up to Christmas. We had, were figuring out how do we turn this into an 80, 90 minute feature and what are the ideas that we need to add to that, to expand on the story, maybe new characters, new challenges, songs, who should we bring in to write the songs? Let's make it a musical. <laughs> Which character would sing? Why would they sing? So I love those conversations too. I'm so glad you brought up the musicals because as I mentioned in the introduction, you've also worked on Broadway musicals. Could you give us an example of one? And have you done that since you've been at Cinemation or has that been something that you've done on the side, on a parallel track or before you left college? In terms of big commercial musical productions, I have not yet had a show that has made it to Broadway. However, the first project that I was working on with Cinemation that Steve hired me for in the first place was this musical adaptation of Farewell, My Concubine, which is still in development. We're very close to having our first full staging, which would be at a regional theater somewhere in the country, and then eventually make it to Broadway. And I have faith that it will, that it will be successful because it's a beautiful, beautiful story, beautiful production. It takes a long time to get a show to Broadway <laughs> as I'm learning. I had no idea. So yeah. how many years is it usually in sort of back end production and writing before it ends up getting to any stage? It depends, right? Steve would say that the average would probably be four to six years, but that was a Disney track. And Disney is a big corporation that has resources. I'm thinking of Hades Town, which won Best Musical at the Tony Awards right before COVID 2019. I think their project took 10 years to get to Broadway. It's been six years for me on Farewell My Concubine. And the lead producers, it's been longer than that. I want to say at least 10 to 15 years for Philip Lee and Rob, since they had the idea to turn this into a musical. So where does that, where does working on Farewell My Concubine fit into your day as a production supervisor? So you've got the pause of fury that's going on. You have other scripts where you're doing the blue sky and character creation and the story piece that you love. Yeah. And then you've got the Farewell, My Concubine. What else is in the mix? I also teach. <laughs> and I play at piano bars. And I make TikTok videos for people to sing along with me from all over, which comes from the love of music, musical theater. So that's your side hustle. Those are your side hustles, right? I would call, what did I say? Teaching and playing TikTok. Yeah, side hustles. So is there, uh, I would love to talk about all of them in a moment, but are there any other, not that you don't already have enough that you're doing, but is there anything else that might go into a typical day for you as a production supervisor at Cinemation? I mean, there's random things that come up, right? Production management is often putting out fires, obviously not literal fires, but oh no, we realized that we overspent in this area. Where can we cut down in other areas to make up for that? Oh no, so-and-so's agent has this stipulation in their contract that they need this kind of tea at their recording session. <laughs> can you get that tea? So those are the random things that pop up in production. You never know. And you're managing all of these loose ends. With a big team. It's not just me. Okay, thank goodness. Yeah. Because, oh my God. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> okay, let's talk about all of these other things that you're doing outside your day job at Cinemation. Because you are yourself an incredibly talented artist. You are a musician, a singer, a dancer, a storyteller, a writer, and a teacher. Talk to us a bit about 
all the ways that you're managing to scratch that creative itch outside of your day job? It's a balance. I think as a creative in this this industry, I, of course, I love what I do making other people's projects. But I think it's also important for me and for other people like me to have their own creative projects. And some of that is smaller. And some of that is, well, what if this is something that could become one of these bigger projects like a Pause of Fury or like a Forum on Concubine? Making time and just making time to do it, right? How do I scratch it? The TikTok videos is, is one way. Like I, that's actually pretty quick and easy to stay in my creative space. I make, I record piano tracks and I post them on TikTok with lyrics and people from all over sing along. That's fun. I also get together with other creatives that I find inspiring and we make new things together. I'm writing a musical right now with my friends, Ellie Martino and Christina Martino. Balancing, managing other creative projects while also creating new things. And you mentioned being a guest lecturer at USC. Yes. And you're lecturing on musical theater song interpretation. Yeah. Uh, Lecturing doesn't totally feel like the right term. It's one class that I come in for. And the students work on musical theater song. They come up and they sing and I play with them. And after they sing, we talk about their... Specifically, that class is about performance and storytelling in musical theater singing. That's what we work on. How has being at Cinemation and being involved in these various projects and being more than just a fly on the wall, but being in the room while these various creative people talk about song creation and lyrics and musical scoring and production, how has that influenced you as an artist, John? Immensely. That's the other thing, right? Is that as part of my job, I'm learning from so many different types of creatives, from composers, from directors, from producers, editors, less applicable from my creation, from the actual artists that do their visual art. But I'm always learning from every creative project. And there's always influence from the last thing that spills into the next thing. And I would also imagine, because a lot of what you were doing with keeping the trains running on time, project management, has to be a bit of a grind. Not necessarily the most glamorous, exciting stuff to do, but because you are learning so much, because you are in these rooms, is that what has kept you going over the last six plus years? Yeah. I mean, specifically, I like to think that Pause of Fury was like my grad school, right? I couldn't have learned more anywhere else than the experience. I couldn't have learned more about the art of making an animated feature from beginning to end than I did on Pause of Fury. Incredible. Let's not talk about grad school. Let's flash back (laughs) to when you were an undergrad. You went to UCLA and graduated cum laude with a BA in communication studies and minors in theater, film, TV, and digital media. Yeah. Did you know what you were going to do with that degree, Johnny, when you graduated? Not specifically. When I came to UCLA, I told myself that I was there to do movie stuff, that I had done enough theater stuff, that I wasn't going to do theater in college, that I was only going to do movie stuff. But then in college, I still mostly ended up doing theater stuff and a little bit of movie stuff. Then also my first job from Steve was hired to be an assistant on their musical for theater again. And it was just, again, serendipitous that Rob was part of that equation and that I got to balance these worlds of theater and animation. I had always loved animation. I knew that I wanted to work in it, but I didn't know exactly what my role in it would be. I just didn't know 
production management. I didn't know what a producer does or even really what a director of animation did. But now I have a much better sense of all those. <laughs> yes, you I'll do. Have my place in it. Yeah. What is communication studies at UCLA? Communication studies at UCLA is broken down into different categories, right? So there are people that focus on political communication. There are people that focus on communication in the digital sphere. And one of the most popular at UCLA because of its location and its proximity to the entertainment industry is communication and media and entertainment. And that was what drew me to the program. They set us up with internships at different entertainment companies. While we were in college, I worked with a talent manager. I worked with a casting agency and a small production company. So those were three internships that exposed me to entertainment business world before officially entering the workforce. So interesting. So you were really more on like a PR track to go into the entertainment world. No, you have a I look on your face. I always, because I didn't know what role, I didn't know anyone that worked in entertainment. My first was my cousin who had moved from Maryland to Los Angeles. And he was working in the mail room at the talent agency CAA. And I thought, oh, that's what I'll do. I'm going to be an agent, right? I'm going to start in the mail room at CAA and I'll be an agent. I just thought that was like the way in. That's what I was going to do. Communications at UCLA exposed me to a lot of other paths for creatives like me in the industry. You mentioned various internships that you had. What other kinds of extracurriculars were you involved in, Johnny? And do you think that those extracurriculars, those internships may have actually played a role in helping you get your foot in the door at Cinemation, or at least impress the right people to get that first job at Cinemation. Absolutely. It's the internships gave me exposure to like company culture, right? Seeing what an office is and seeing just what that looks like. My extracurriculars, my theater stuff at UCLA with Hooligan Theater Company and later. We started with my friends, a second theater group called Positivity Productions and put on our own shows. That was where I learned the collaborativeness, the real groundwork that needs to be done to put up shows. The difference between high school theater and our our shows in college was that it was student run. It was really the first time where all of us were the adults. (laughs) It wasn't adults putting on the show. Okay, stand here, kid, like to make sure you hit your light. It was all of us working together as peers to create big shows at UCLA. The shows would have sometimes up to 60 people with Hooligan Theater Company. And that's for sure the path to to where I am now. And that impressed Rob. (laughs) Yeah, no doubt. So what advice do you have, John, for those who may be starting their senior year this fall or those who may have just graduated in 2022 and are interested in breaking into Hollywood, Mm -hmm. whether it be in animated features or in live action filmmaking, where do you think they should be focusing their job search and does it matter where they start? I would say don't be shy is number one piece of advice. I got lucky that I ran into Steve again, but it was because I wasn't shy. I saw him and I got up and I said, hello, right? And it was because I said, hello, that I now have my job today. (laughs) So don't be shy. People do want to help you. Find the people that want to help you. If there's someone, literally anyone that you are interested in talking to in Hollywood, I think this would apply to any industry, but I can speak from this experience. If you can find them on LinkedIn or wherever or at a dinner for strangers, You can reach out and say, hey, I'd love to talk to you for 15 minutes. Grab a a caffeinated beverage together. And almost anyone can find 15 minutes to talk to you. When you have the chance to talk to them, show interest in what they're doing because you are genuinely interested, but also be vocal about what you're looking for. If you know that you want to be a producer, let them know because you're not going to be a producer until you verbally express, I'm trying to be a producer. I'm interested in opportunities that will lead me on the path toward being a producer. 
do you think that it is wise to be open to any opportunity to get your foot in the door, whether it be producing, whether it be working as someone's executive assistant or fill in the blank, whatever that job title is, if it gets you into that environment? All experience is valuable experience, but some experience is more valuable than other experience. Absolutely earn your stripes, spend a day or two or however long PAing on a set where you have to <laughs> drive and pick up the soda for the day, and, you know, do, do that kind of work. But I'd also say don't sell yourself short and be looking for those opportunities that are really going to take you further. Well, any opportunity is a good opportunity, especially if you're trying to pay the bills, take it. Don't stop looking for the opportunities that are going to advance you toward where you need to be. Don't get stuck in anything because know your worth. Know your worth. Are there certain job boards that you might want to flag for our listeners that they might not be aware of in terms of where they could go to find these opportunities? Yes, UTA job list is one. Entertainmentcareers.net is another one people post. And those are places where you can definitely find like first assistant type jobs, but also reach out to people. Don't just, I've never gotten a job I've applied for. I've never, I've never, got, I've applied for jobs. And I've like maybe a teaching job here or there I've applied for and gotten it. But any like production type job, I've never applied and gotten the job. Any production job I've had is through talking to other people. Oh, Johnny, let's bring you on this project. We need help. Right. That's my insight into that. Amazing, amazing advice. And use your alumni network. Absolutely. Maximize that because it's a golden key. I have two final time for coffee questions, Johnny, and these are questions I try to ask all of my guests. The first one is, if you could share a time in your professional life when you struggled, maybe you failed or flopped or screwed up in some way. And most important here is how you persevere and if there was a lesson that you learned in the process. The first thing that comes to mind, right at the start of COVID lockdown, so March 2020, things were kind of slow as the world was figuring out how to adjust to this new normal, work from home. And a couple friends and I, who I've produced shows with, live shows with in the past, and who also have an affinity for watching the reality television show The Bachelor, decided, what if we produce a show? for singles that are at home during COVID. And we call it Love is Confined because there was a popular TV show called Love is Blind. If we play off that, Love is Confined. And we set up singles that are living at home during COVID on virtual dates. And we style it as a tiered dating style show. We, over a couple weeks, had a great time. We set up many dates and a couple couples came out of that dating show. Um, Really? That's cool. Yeah. And we had fun because it was something that was new for us. and We were producing in a new format. And the plan was always to... We recorded everything. We had all of their... We set it up on a Discord channel. So we had all of their text messages, all of their videos. We recorded everything. And the plan was always to edit this content and release it to the public in some way. Ultimately, by the time we had actually finished our little experiment, I'd say the production of this reality show, we got to the end and we had so much footage and life was kind of picking up again in a way that all of our other jobs were taking over. And none of us were ready for how much work there was to do to actually edit this content and put it out into a world in a digestible format. Even though we had fun and we did our project, we failed in that we never put it out into the world. Like we're just sitting on this content. And so the lesson from that would have been to plan, to not underestimate, right? 
any project that you put yourself into. I think we all underestimated the amount of work it takes to edit and produce reality because we had never done it before. So if we had talked to someone before who had done this or brought on someone who is a more professional editor or someone that had had that experience before, they could have warned us. I'm like, hey, just, you know, this is going to take a lot of time. None of us were anticipating the amount of time it would have taken. So don't underestimate projects that you are signing up for. I think that is such a great example and such a creative one to have put together that your own dating show. But I could have told you if you were just running lots and lots of video that, holy cow, if you were not logging it as you went along, good luck. Exactly. (laughs) But it sounds like some good came out of it. Yeah, we definitely had a fun time. And some of those people are still friends, people that wouldn't have known each other. Lovely. Thank you so much for sharing. Final question. If you could go back to UCLA and do it all over again, Johnny, but based on the wisdom you have now, what advice would you give yourself? Talk to Steve. <laughs> um, that's the first thing. I mean, I, I got lucky that I, I listened to my future self in that moment. Just what you did on campus and what you study and how you spent your time while you were an undergrad. It's hard to say. I don't have a lot of regrets about the time I spent at UCLA. I like to say I majored in fun classes. So that's advice I'd give to anyone that is doing college. Like take the classes that you're genuinely interested in, not just the ones that you have to check mark for your major. Stay in contact with the professors that are meaningful to you. Maintain good relationships there. I'm trying to think of like any specific advice for my younger self in college. Um, instead of these general things. But I think those general things I would have listened to. Johnny, I want to thank you so much for making time for coffee today with me and the T4C community. Where can our listeners find you on TikTok or any other social channels that you may have? Sure. Thank you. My name is Johnny Pearl. That's J-O-N-N-Y. P-E-R-L. So that's Johnny without an H, Pearl without an A. And I'm on Instagram at Johnny Pearl, um, TikTok at Johnny.Pearl. And if you guys have questions about, you know, any of this stuff, reach out. I'd be happy to talk with you. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of T4C. And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the coaching tab at time, the number four, coffee.org or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Thank you.